Welcome. Uh, welcome to all. My name is Georgia Yellow, and I am an associate professor in the School of Media and Communication. I'm also director of research and innovation, and that's kind of why I'm here doing this. So it's a pleasure for me to introduce our speaker for the 2018 Jay Blumler Lecture today. Sylvia Weisbord is professor in the School of Media and Public Affairs at George Washington University in Washington, DC. He is the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Communication and the former editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Press and Politics, which are two of the more important journals in our field. He has lectured and worked in more than 30 countries, published 13 books, and written over 100 journal articles, book chapters, and newspaper columns. He serves on the advisory board of the Latin American program of the Open Society Foundations, and he holds a licenciatura in sociology from the Universidad de Buenos Aires and a PhD in sociology from the University of California, San Diego. His many recent co-authored and co-edited books include News of Baltimore, Race, Rage, and the City, The Routledge Companion to Media and Human Rights, and Media Movements, Civil Society and Media Policy Reform in Latin America. His lecture today is titled From the Ministry of Truth to Post-Truth Politics, Populism and the New Crisis of Public Communication. In the spirit of Jay Blumler's work, Sylvia's lecture suggests that we are now confronted with a new crisis driven by unprecedented structural changes in the production, circulation, and consumption of public information. He will therefore talk about how the current state, or, or chaos, as he may put it, of public communication raises different challenges that cannot be fully captured by all diagnoses. On a slightly different note, there may be another interesting ongoing link between Jay and Silvio. As you know, Silvio is from Latin America and has written a lot about the media there, in particular Argentina, uh, but he's also written about the continent as a whole from a media communication studies perspective. Jay was in Chile shortly before Allende was overthrown in 1973. After all these years, he recently, I'm told, Jay, that you recently found your notes from that trip. And Jay is currently involved in a major writing project on the role of the Chilean media at that time. I suspect that this, together with insights from Silvio's lectures, uh, lecture, obviously, will be exciting subjects for conversations um, that will take place during and beyond the reception that we have organized for just after the lecture just out here, so please do make sure that you stop by for a drink or two. Um, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Silvia Weisbord at this year's, as this year's invited speaker for the School of Media and Communications, Jane Blumner Lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Julia, for kind uh, introduction. Um, thanks to, to the school, to Jay, for the invitation and for um, your hospitality. It's a true honor for me to, to give this, this lecture. Um, so where I start, uh, what I'm going to present today is sort of driven by the questions that I just put up there. Um, what I'm trying to figure out is uh, what are the essential elements of the current age of public communication? Uh, can we describe it as a crisis, a concept that has been uh, used in, in the field of political communication and journalism studies? If it is a crisis, what kind of crisis? Uh, and exactly what is it that is in crisis? But also, I think that if it is a crisis, I think that we, this should prompt us to interrogate foundational normative models about public communication. Not only about the premises of what we believe is democratic communication, but the viability of different models. And it seems to me that we have been in a state of perpetual crisis. If you look at the literature 25 years ago, there already was a lot of talk about, about crisis. Um, so, but the question again, what is it that is in, in, in crisis? One could argue that what is in crisis probably is not so much reality, but actually the way that we understand what democratic communication is. And let me be more explicit about this. That if we think about democratic communication as including some kind of reason 
deliberation, informed citizenship, and dialogue, how do we sort of match that normative model, that expectation, at a time in which one of the loudest words around democratic communication today is resistance, or what I will say, a form of, of expression and action that don't fit easily in the model of deliberative politics. Instead, what we have, both on the, re on the left and on the, on the right, is a language of critique, a language of mockery, uh, trolling as a negative and as a positive action, the satire of, of power. So how do we sort of understand these trends in public communication with the model that still is foundational to our field? Or we should stick to our philosophical guns, and I put this as a rhetorical question, and continue to insist in the centrality of information, dialogue, and understanding. And my warning here is that I'm not going to give you any optimistic message. I think that, is, that it will be wise to leave optimism for a better moment. So as I was preparing these this notes, of course, I reread uh, Jay's work, particularly from the early to the mid-90s, and the work that he did with Michael Gurevich around the notion of the crisis of communication for citizenship, and they described several symptoms of this crisis, such as depoliticization, cynicism, the simplification of public issues, the exclusion of citizens from from voice in the public sphere, the excessive negativity of the press, but also they worried about the viability of mainstream journalistic organizations and civic adequacy related to the prospects of citizenship and democracy. So reading that sort of portrayal of that crisis of, of public communication, my question is if we have entered a new age, uh, and if so, how to call it? What will capture the essential elements of today's age? What are these distinctive features? But also because whether or not this new age that we can talk about is a global phenomenon, not just limited to the West, as long as we are finding similar, not identical, of course, trends in public communication across the world. And here I have in mind polarization, the threats to democracy, the rise of illiberal democracy, the troubling situation of the press, uh, the rise of populism. These are not trends just limited to the West or to a few countries in the West, but these are global trends. So the argument I will present, just in case you fall asleep and you miss the rest of my, of my presentation here, is that the new crisis that we are confronting right now is driven by unprecedented structural changes in the production, circulation, and consumption of public information. The current chaos of public communication raises different challenges from previous ages, that I think these challenges are captured by the concept of post-truth uh, uh, politics. And what, to me, this brings up is the crisis of the viability of the vision of democratic communication. Um, we are at a new political crossroads, and I'm not saying anything completely new to all of you, I assume, here. We are talking at a time of growing pessimism. If political communication research offer very worried observations 25 years ago, how about now? We are in the middle of a string of new books that talk about the decline of democracy, or as a recent book puts it, uh, how democracies die, Right? We're not at a time of sort of high hopes about democracy any longer. And it's hard to find bright spots for democratic communication these days. Even Silicon Valley recently has changed its tune after peddling techno-optimism related to democracy for, for decades. Now, one could argue that it's offering a more temper, not necessarily a more gloomy view, but a more temper view about the current conditions. This new era has been described in many ways, and I just sort of want to remind what many colleagues recently have said about this. Uh, Peter Van Els and his colleagues recently have a paper that has been widely cited, widely discussed about major disruptions in democratic uh, communication. 
related to declining supply of political information, declining quality of news, increased media concentration, declining di uh, diversity of, of news, increased fragmentation and polarization, increased relativism, and increased inequality in political knowledge. Uh, and, in up and in a forthcoming piece, Lance Bennett and Barbara Fetch, probably here, talk about disrupted public spheres. A number of authors have also used the notion of fracture democracies to convey very sort of uh, a similar sense of current development. In my mind, the way to summarize this is that what we're witnessing right now is the chaos of public communication, driven by the collapse and multi-layer news gatekeeping and new forms of gatekeeping with the rise of social media, for example. We're witnessing the disintermediation and new forms of mediation. We're talking about a time of fracture, communication commons, and the proliferation of media spheres. And we're talking about the digitalization of public life and extreme mediatization in the way that every corner of public life is being mediatized. In this context, it seems to me that we need to understand what I call the transition from the Ministry of Truth, of course Orwell's classical concept, to a situation of post-truth. The Ministry of Truth idea embodied the old communication order that featured distinctive media systems, a dominant and a cohesive press atop the information pyramid, and clear divisions between media producers and consumers. And as Jay Blumber and many others um, wrote about, such order had enormous flaws for cultivating a vibrant, informed, and diverse citizenship. But that was the time in which journalism was seen as a central sense-making institution of modernity in the modern regime of truth. Um, the question is whether or not we are still living in such era or such single regime of truth in public communication, if there ever was anything like that. The regime of truth understood as an accepted rules and established practices that define public knowledge and regulate discourse, which, if we follow the literature, this was premised on the principles of the scientific model and the feasibility of quote-unquote value-neutral mechanisms to produce uncontestable facts to document reality. And of course, much of modern journalism was premised, was grounded in this vision of how to produce legitimate knowledge. Instead, this notion of post-truth communicative politics that sort of gained some traction in the last year or so talks about something different. I'm not completely married to the notion of post-truth communicative politics. It's, it's a mouthful. And, but I mean, it, in some ways, it captures something that I think that is basically right. I'm not fond of categorical labels either. It might bring you up more citations. But it's very difficult to capture, in a parsimonious manner, absolutely everything going on in public communication today. Uh, and of course, this is not something that started in 2016, right? Uh, but in some ways, the idea of post-truth represents the culmination of developments that have been brewing for a long time. Um, what are we talking about by post-truth? We're talking about fragmented and fractured truths. It's not the absence, but the relativism of facts and truth, two very different concepts. We're talking about the mainstreaming of factless convictions that are relatively impervious to corrections and constant disinformation by myriad institutions and groups. And we're talking about the, uh, the idea, the, the truth-telling and recent communication as a common public project has become uncertain in not forever compromise under the new conditions. What are the symptoms of that we are in a post-truth communicative politics? Let me just mention a few. Deep pockets of misinformation. Um, in 2015, my first issue for the Journal of Communication was an issue devoted to um, the prevalence, consequence, and remedy of misinformation in mass media systems that look at a variety of sectors in communication research from health to political communication sort of documenting a very similar phenomenon, not only misinformation, but the, the challenges of correcting misinformation. 
And here we're talking about forms of knowledge that flatly negate scientific and technical facts and conventional notions of truth. Examples of this is historical denialism, uh, also the huge literature on the rejection of scientific conclusions, uh, the literature on environmental communication and health communication, including the literature on the rejection of vaccines, of uh, immunization, perceptions about the transmission of infectious diseases, the performance of healthcare, so on and so forth, which basically, again, this large pocket of misinformation about these issues, as well as a substantial literature on public opinion about public views about policies that impact being filled with sort of misinformation about a range of issues, taxes, budget, immigration, public safety. Um, but related to this is also that the growing literature on, on fact checking and factual corrections, it's very ambivalent about the, um, the likelihood that that misinformation could be corrected. And basically, much of that research shows, in my mind, the strength of counterfactual beliefs, beliefs that are impervious to factual corrections, and beliefs that actually are meshed with identity politics. And that largely will explain why they are impervious to factual corrections. Also, in parallel, another literature on partisan selectivity in fact-checking actually shows exactly basically the same thing, not just the way that people are exposed to corrections based on partisan or ideological convictions, but the way that they share that information on social media and, and so forth. Another symptom of these post-truth times, low and fractured trust in news media, nothing new here in terms of low trust of the news media across a number of democracies. This is uh, Gallup data on, on, the, on the US. But in my mind, what is interesting is not only the declining trust in the news media at large, but the, the partisan divide in terms of trust in the, in the media. Um, so this is um, data from uh, Pew, from, from, from the Pew Center from, from last year, uh, about a growing sharper uh, divide in the way that Republicans and Democrats trust or lack trust in, in the media. Um, in fact, a, recent, a more recent survey by uh, the Pointer Institute published in 2017, the Media Trust Survey, actually confirms the trends documented by, by Pew's most recent study. What else? Other symptoms. Disinformation and news exposure and sharing. The whole phenomenon of quote unquote fake news. I don't like that word, so, and I know many people don't like it either. But I mean, what that phenomenon is symptomatic of is sort of this, this post-truth times. And to me what it reflects is what, actually what we have known for a while, but now we have more evidence actually, more, more data to actually make the point of the different contracts, the readership contracts between news producers and, and readers, between news organizations and their, their audiences. And on this topic, my take is that what that shows is that truth is not something as intrinsic to news or ideas in the realist or objective tradition of thinking about the relationship between truth and news, but actually truth is pragmatically uh, um, a construct, uh, constructed. Uh, to paraphrase what William James said, uh, truth is what happens to news, he said about ideas, something rather than is intrinsic to ideas, or in this case, to news, and it's pragmatically constructed within certain historical, situational, identity-grounded conditions. What else? In my mind, the, the literature on high chase environment and partisan bubbles, I'm not gonna get into that, I know there's a lot of debate about whether or not partisan bubbles are real or how open they are, uh, but in some ways what they reflect is this question of fractured truth, and that's what I mean by situation of post-truth. Of post I don't know if you have seen this, um, this figure from um, uh, media sources here on Twitter. To me, it not only shows the bubble, but actually what is the center of the bubble. And at the center of the conservative Republican bubble here on Twitter is not even Fox News. It was Breitbart. Okay? 
um, and the different ways in which the so-called mainstream news, traditionally in the in the U.S., really are part of the so-called blue um, bubble. Um, so, to me, in order to understand this post-truth politics, we need to understand sort of the present communication chaos, which speaks to the decentralization of the politics of falsehood and propaganda. And it's linked to the operation of simultaneous logics, commercial, political, and social cultural logics. Let me explain this more, more in detail. Post-truth communication is anchored in dynamics that are very different than this notion of ministry of truth uh, talk about. Because these are is grounded in dynamics and forces beyond the state. Basically what it refers is the alliance or the articulation of corporate money interested in this information and taking advantage of these post-truth communication chaos conditions. The popularity of legacy and online media unconstrained by the conventional quote-unquote professional ideals of journalism, fairness, even-handedness, so on and so forth. The popularity of social media and personal networks for the dissemination, the sharing uh, of information by elite queues, indexing, and mobilization. This is what President Trump does day in and day out. Queuing in, indexing, mobilizing opinion that is part of this phenomenon, that taps into deep-seated, non-factual beliefs virtually about anything, and is articulated in everyday identity politics. Um, one example would be white nationalism. Right? And this is what sort of these post-truth politics reflect the articulation, sort of a, a toxic combination in today's politics. Post-truth represents the erasure of distinctions in which anything can be true or can be falsified, which is exactly what more than, what, 70 years ago, Hannah Harent and Adorno already talked about. The idea when the distinction of the fact between fact and fiction, true and false, no longer exists. Uh, the idea that truth is no longer possible when the distinction between true and false no, doesn't longer exist. So clearly here we're not dealing with a new phenomenon, but we are dealing with the ascendancy of something that we know of. We know that we are in trouble when we are quoting Hannah Arendt and Adorno, that something is seriously wrong. When we go back to sort of 1950s, 1960s way of understanding sort of post-totalitarian um, societies. Um, So my question to this is what kind of communicative politics are dominant and possible? Um, in my mind, the global upsurge of, pop of populist politics is symptomatic of the consolidation of post-truth communication as a distinctive feature of contemporary politics. I would argue that there is an affinity, elective affinity, to put it in Bavarian terms, between populism and post-truth communication. Populism thrives in the current conditions of public communication. And this is what I will try to argue in my next slides. Why? Because populism Manichaean politics stands in opposition to the possibility of truth-telling as a collective effort to produce agreed-upon facts and to reach consensus on the correspondence between assertions and reality. No news here. For the last years, the press has been filled with notions, with headlines about you know, the populist moment, so to speak. Again, not only in Europe or, the, or in the US, but in other um, parts of the world. To me, what, is interest, what we need to do is to analyze populism beyond electoral results. If Hillary Clinton would have won, we still will need to talk about populism, for example. Uh, why? Because in my mind, what it reflects, the current populist upsurge movement, is broad structural trends in public communication. Why is that? Well, the political ontology of populism opposes principles of democratic public communication. And that's why I believe that it fits central characteristic of what we're saying. I know populism is a very ambiguous concept, and uh, much of the literature tried to sort of settle that discussion. It will never be settled uh, because it is, by definition, a very ambiguous concept. 
Mueller's recent book, I think, does a good job in mapping out the different ways of understanding populism. Um, what is distinctive about populism in this long discussion about what populism is, to me is populism illiberalism. Populism, as Benjamin Arditi um, uh, put in his book, populism always walks on the edge of democracy. Um, in what way we define populism illiberalism? Because of the opposition to bedrock principles of democratic communication, such as freedom of speech, freedom of the press, the right to communication, fact-based and recent public debate, the idea of public criticism, informed citizenship, tolerance, and empathy. A few years ago, I wrote a book about populism in, in Latin America, Pinky, this argument. I never thought I was going to talk about exactly these questions in the US and, and, in, and in Europe. So what are the sources of populism, illiberalism, and opposition to democratic communication? Basically, there are two sources of this. One is the agonistic view of politics, and the second is an opposition to fact-based, truth-seeking public discourse. Um, I feel ambivalent about putting discourse as an essential element of populism, as many authors have said. I see why sort of the rhetoric of populism in some ways defines someone as, as populism. Um, but I think is, I'm always reminded of what people used to say about Muhammad Ali. Don't watch what he's saying, watch what he's doing. And with populism, it seems to me that we often made the mistake of po following populism too much of what populism is saying rather than what populism is actually doing. And that's what I'm trying to, to get at here. So what do I mean by democratic communication? Let me offer a very comprehensive definition of very long discussion here that many people in this room have written extensively about. But to me, what it means is it implies some notion of the communication commons, the public sphere in classical uh, uh, concept, that facilitates informed dialogue, civility, diversity, tolerance, solidarity, reason, and facts. Some version of, of this. This is the classic aspiration for a liberal, progressive, democratic, we can sort of find what the right adjective is, of, of the public sphere. Populism is exactly the stands opposite to what I just said. Why? Because populism believes that all politics is conflict rather than politics being the search for consensus or the search for understanding or the search for listening to what the other side has to say. In fact, what populism does in communicative terms, not just in political terms, take, takes adversarialism of politics to extreme. We often forget that actually an essential concept, an essential component of politics is adversarialism, choosing adversaries. But it takes it to an extreme, this idea of you know, friend-foe um, model of, of, of politics. In terms of communication issues, this vision of, of populism is reflected in its antagonism to press autonomy and um, in the, um, independence, its constant condemnation of the media as part, quote unquote, of the system. Uh, disdain for the press and dissident expression reflected in their refusal to hold open press conference in many cases, preference for friendly press conference or friendly sort of communicative spaces, the aggressive relation with reporters who ask challenging uh, um, uh, questions, um, the constant confrontation with journalists and news organizations, uh, the support, and I have many examples that I could share with you from Latin America in which populist governments set up digital harassment networks of trolls in order to combat uh, press criticism and critical speech as well as constant attacks on reporters, intellectuals, non-government organizations, and, and science. Um, all this stuff sounds too familiar for anyone who has followed populism in other regions of the world, such as Latin America or East, um, Eastern Europe, um, as well as cases of legal persecution and doing legal support for scrutiny of power. Populism, in many cases, has disabled constitutional mechanisms that could clip the power of the presidency and change the rules of the democratic game, most notorious recent cases, 
will be Venezuela in Latin America, as well as the current governments, Hungary and, and Poland. Um, and the reason why is because populism conceives that politics is pure agonism. Therefore, populism has no use for the notion of the communicative commons. The idea of the commons is antithetical to a purely belligerent conflict center view of politics. From the populist perspective, who needs recent deliberation across difference when politics is about fostering conflict and executive decisionism? You can tell that I'm living in the United States. Um, but also, another component of this ontology, the communication ontology of populism, is the dismissal of fact based, truth pursuing communication. I'm of the camp that believes the search for truth is central democratic communication, even as elusive and difficult truth is. But populism takes this notion further. Populism embraces the notion that truth are always partial, and that the truth, as such, does not exist as a collective and common goal. Why? From populism, from populism perspective, truth is divided. It's anchored in particular social interest. And therefore, the truth-seeking politics that populism endorses is basically about reaffirming certain quote-unquote popular, put in quotes because it's not true, but against so-called elite lies. Um, so, for populism, truth politics is about the denunciation of false beliefs propagated by an array of institutions, the liberal institutions of democracy, the media, parliament, justice, civic society organizations, higher education, science, that are as part of the quote unquote ruling bloc. It will surprise you in this Gramscian concept that is actually uh, widespread in populist talk about the way of the critique of um, liberal institutions. And the purpose is basically the cultivation of the expression of quote unquote popular views that are seen as ignored or distorted by uh, ruling powers. By doing that, what populism does, it jettisons the entire edifice of liberal democratic truth telling. Whether we think about truth telling in, in a from a democratic perspective, either in terms of autonomous, neutral, dispassionate fact producing institutions, as one current of way of thinking about this, or truth as a result of communitarian dialogue and intersubjective understanding. Publicism has no patience for any of these versions of what truth-telling is. In fact, populism does not believe that truth-telling is compromised by politics. Here we have, like, you know, tradition that, you know, Anna Harent and and many others always believing that truth telling is like to be compromised by politics, but the proximity between the truth teller and, and politics. In fact, populism believes the opposite, that truth is essentially, almost naturally, a political project. And it rejects the notion that speaking truth to power demands a healthy distance from politics. So, in summary, what populism does is embraces a conflict center vision of politics. And it perpetuates the notion that the only way to achieve truth is partisan, ideological, uh, partial truth that negate fact-based truth searching as a common enterprise. And this is the notion that, in my mind, sort of festers in the absence of the communication commons and deepens worrisome trends in contemporary politics, intolerance, aversion to recent debate, misinformation, and weak accountability. So populism sort of grows in these conditions and reinforces these conditions. Um, so this leads me to the question, if we are living in populist times, how are communicative politics that promote tolerance and engagement with others, fact-based and truth-telling, critical rationality and solidarity beyond, possible beyond limited cases? Hmm? Can any normative vision of democratic communication be dominant anyway amid fractured public communication. Um, this leads me to what I was trying to say at the beginning to sketch out this sort of a new crisis of the model of democratic communication that becomes in my mind very clear with the ascendancy of, of, of populism. That is related to the new politics of misinformation, 
I'm not just talking here about you know, a new chapter or a new form of the propaganda wars, but something deeper, the popularity of misinformation, um, in which broad dispersed actors, uh, it, meaning by this, a broad dispersed process with multiple actors, rather than this information centralized around states and or corporations in the way that used to be theorized in, in the past. And the argument that I make is this sort of affinity between the present communication conditions, aside from other conditions, social, political, and, and populism. And, and this is part of the, sort of the pessimist conclusion is that current conditions favor communicative politics that are opposed to expectations of foundational models. The idea of critical public reasoning in a marketplace of ideas with all its imperfections. Um, what to do next then? In my mind, this sort of current times of populism and post-truth politics should not be simply criticized. Uh, should not be say we should not be sort of be happy with our own beliefs and conclude that you know we are right, they are wrong, this is terrible. Uh, but rather we should re-examine the viability of the democratic model or the multiple ways in which this democratic model has been formulated. Basically the question is how democratic ideals of communication are effective in everyday settings particularly when they confront real-world pockets of prejudice, hatred, and divisions amid the global tide of populist politics. So, a book was put together some, some years ago in honor of Jay Blumberg called Can the Media Serve Democracy? And this question remains as relevant as, as ever. Because even if we answer affirmatively this question, the question is how can it the media serve democracy in a very different, fractured, chaotic public communication scenario. What will it mean that the media will serve democracy better? In light of this, what I think that we need to do is to interrogate the feasibility of democratic communication. Um, we also need to do that particularly I mean the current rise of what I mentioned briefly at the very beginning, the politics of adversarialism, contestation, and imposition. It's hard to think about the politics of consensus seeking as the result of a communicative process today amid adversarialism, contestation, and imposition. At least where I come from, let's say the Americas, the word that sounds strong, loud these days is resist rather than consensus seeking and listening to the other side, or let's find some common ground. To talk about this goes against where much of the debate and actually the energy on both sides, on the left and on the right, are. Um, much of what is vibrant politics that captures some of the ideas of democratic communication, at least in progressive movements, is the opposition to populism, or what populism represents, nativism, racism. So if we look at, for example, Black Lives Matter, environmental activism, the women's movement, LGBT activism, we have movements driven in, in a communication perspective by the idea of opposition, denunciation, resistance, shaming populism, tied to the politics of passion, the politics of identity, rather than bracketing passionate politics. Um, so the question is how, what kind of communicative politics are possible in this, in this context? On the one hand, I think what we have is the rise of this sort of idea that part of communicative politics in a democracy is about sort of listening, understanding others, particularly those who suffer different forms of exclusion. But at the same time, it's a different kind of communicative politics versus what populism represents, what populism is emblematic of. It's a very different kind of communicative politics. In some ways, what, politi what populism has reminded us about 
is that politics is not just the liberation, rationality, or consensus building, but that politics is a contact game. Um, and in fact, part of the anti-populist reaction today understands that one, should not, that one should not bring a spoon to a knife fight. I don't have too many experiences with knife fights, but I've been in academia for a while, so I think that that's always a good piece of advice. So I want to leave you with some questions, and truly I have no straight answers to the questions that I'm going to pose now. How is the model of communication commons possible today? What kind of communicative parties are possible amid the information chaos and the network public sphere? We talked about a fragmentation of what we used to think in terms of the public sphere. So this question is about how to recover a sense of commonness among divisive and corrosive politics that ride on this fracture uh, public communication. A second question, where are the virtuous practices, the practices that are usually emblematic of these different ideals, the foundational models of democratic communication? Uh, can they be replicated and scale up? We can always find cases. The problem is not to cherry pick cases in order to make a broad argument about current trends. Um, or to put it differently, if there are sort of good signs of things, of examples of democratic communication, how to contextualize them in a context in which it's very difficult to find much, much hope. Third question, how do we explain the failure or the limited success, if you want to be more hopeful, to reshape politics follow ideas of democratic communication given today's situation? So my belief on this question is that we should not continue to insist on what is right or what is desirable or what we wish, but how those hopes are possible given current conditions of a high choice information environment, selective exposure, selective sharing. In fact, much of the political communication literature doesn't provide a strong argument in terms of the way that people interact and navigate this complex, chaotic public communication for the hopes that many of us, I assume, always had about communication as a collective project. Um, and my last question is, should the model of informed recent dialogic communication be revisited in the current conditions or perhaps transcended? I'm raising this question because in some ways I find that it's, it's very difficult to be Habermasian today, particularly in the way that the field of political communication was 25 years ago. Um, it's also very difficult to believe in the idea of the marketplace of ideas following John Stuart Mill as a corrective to misinformation. At best, we have ambivalent evidence that the marketplace of ideas, that the truth will prevail, or that misinformation errors will be corrected. Um, otherwise, it seems to me that we might run the risk of preaching to the choir. Um, because what we need to address are the current political conditions, plus everything that we know about the psychology of information processing that actually shows the inclination in the direction of identity reinforcement sticking to our beliefs rather than something that comes closer to the democratic dream of critical reason and common spaces. Um, the capacity to change minds, which is central to the notion of the marketplace of ideas in its different variations, more conservative or more progressive, is premised on this notion where actually the evidence is very limited to actually prove this, this idea. So let me suggest some ideas for further research, and I'm going to conclude very shortly. Um, we need cross-national studies to understand the rise, consolidation, and impact of post-truth politics to test basically what I propose here. Does it work across different uh, countries, if countries is still the relevant unit of analysis here? Examine further the proposition that I put forth of the affinity between fractured public communication and populism. 
Identify the drivers of specific forms of democratic communication, from principles to practice. Where does it happen? And why and how? And I know many of you have done already a lot of work around this. But the question is, how do we sort of scale up this? Dialogue, tolerance, and solidarity across identities and across groups. And perhaps something else to do in our to-do list for further research is to revisit the rationalistic and dialogic model in light of current challenges, but also in light of the rising strength of the affective and protest paradigm that doesn't fit quite well in a traditional model. So, and let me conclude with this. I know that Jay, in the past, has sang Worry Man Blues to express his downbeat views on today's political communication process. So what we need to do is to actually find and understand signs of hope of the kind of democratic communication that many of us envision. Um, in fact, what I think we need to do is to prove Kafka wrong. Kafka, of course, said there is hope, but it's not for us. And so we have to, have to prove that that's not right, that there actually there is some hope in different parts of society that actually come closer to the kind of democratic communication guided by the principles I mentioned earlier, tolerance, solidarity, understanding, listening. Um, we need to document and understand better what works rather than only chronicle the miseries and the difficulties of current time. So in addition to explaining irrationality, barbarism, nonsense, as inhumanity, we should also identify and explain communicative practices that actually appeal to the better angels rather than the crooked timber of humanity. And this is basically what I learned from Jay's work, that even if we document a very troubling situation, we always need to find a realistic way where the hope is for something that comes closer to a model of democratic communication. And this is one of the main lessons that I draw from his wonderful work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Silvio, for a fantastic um, um, lecture and, and, and very, very pertinent in these moments of time that we're living. Uh, as you know, I'm, I'm from Venezuela, and I remember when Chavez ran the first time for president in 1998. Um, and, and obviously, a lot of people went and voted for him, and he won with a landslide in that time. And I knew it was a mistake. Uh, but I, I did understand why people voted for him in that time, because there was no hope. They, they, people had nothing to lose. And it's the same here in Brexit. A lot of people who voted for Brexit, you know, thought. So I think this issue of hope is very important. But one of the things that I remember in 1998 that people in Latin America were suffering from, which had deprived them from hope, was this whole process of globalization. And in part, populism is a, has been a response to globalization. And, and in a way, this is why Trump was su successful in, in selling a specific message. So I wonder what, what, how uh, can a highly globalized media system respond to this anti-globalization sentiment that is fundamental in explaining populism and post-truth nowadays? Um, great question. Uh, to your question about, the, spe the specific question on global media system respond to this, I'm not sure if we can talk about system any, any longer. Because the responses are, already have been clear, 
that there are very different responses from different media organizations and news organizations vis-a-vis -vis the insurgency of populism with the different characteristics in different parts of, of the world. Um, I could tell you what I would like or what actually some examples, some virtuous cases of how the media has reacted, but it's easy to find examples on the other side, the media doing basically riding the populist wave, fostering populism, being central to the rise of, of, of populism, uh, largely explained by the old deficiencies, problems, limitations of the media um, that many of, many of you already documented in different parts of the world. So populism is not a, you know, a, a strange to the media system that we have self-criticized for a long time. But the question is whether or not we still can talk about a media system in this sort of fragmented, chaotic, I'm not saying it doesn't, I mean, as an, as an analytical tool is, is, is useful. But we sort of, you think about sort of a, in some ways a dismember, fracture uh, media system. It's not clear what, as such, it could do. What will be examples of virtuous um, behaviors? And I would say that even in the United States today, that we could talk about, it's very difficult to talk about the US media system around this. Doesn't, that, that doesn't mean to endorse, you know, that it's a pluralist media system by any means. But at a time in sort of deep divisions in the way, for example, the populist themes and a populist administration is being covered, it's hard to talk about sort of what should be, you know, the desirable way that the quote unquote media system should respond to this. And in some ways what happens is what populism aims to do is to divide the media. It thrives in that environment because it takes the media as sort of a punching bag, as sort of the, um, as, as, as the enemy. I, mean, I don't have to explain this to, to you. So that is, that is a constant theme in, in populism around the world. The question is why that's well because of political sort of strategic reasons, it makes sense. So then again, back to your question, what should the media system to, to do about this? I, will, I can tell you, you know, denounce, understand, you know, the causes for, for populism, um, denounce when populism sort of undermines uh, uh, civil rights, civil liberties. Um, but as you know better than I do, I mean, in, in any country which has been governed by populism for a long period of time, it's impossible to talk about media system as, as a single unity, right? Um, that's what I'm saying. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I would like to point out that uh, what you mentioned about adversarial approach of different viewpoints is actually employed by that um, august body of democratic governance as parliament nowadays or even in the past. This is the approach that is accepted in English, uh, British parliament at least. Uh, so um, that, that kind of approach is not uh, unusual and has been employed for centuries. Another example of similar approach is scientific. Uh, when any new idea, before it's being even uh, contemplated to be accepted as a theory, is being, sh is being torn apart rather rapidly by scientific circles and it has to stand on its own and defend itself. So uh, approach may be... Um, looked upon as adversarial. Right. But um, I would permit myself not quite agree with you on the um, on danger of the fact that this pyramid of information dissemination from uh, uh, media institutions onto the uh, citizens um, is, is actually uh, something that is not advantageous. Uh, that pyramid is actually melting, and greater and greater swaths of population are directly uh, engaging in discourse and dialogue through a variety of popular media. So I actually think that um, uh, conditions are actually rather better than worse. Yeah. Great points. I, I, I agree, actually, with both issues that you raised. On the first one, the question that adversarialism in the two realms that you described, 
in democratic politics and in science assume some common rules, some common ground rules of, of um, engagement, of communication, right? Um, that's what we have in science. This is that classic book by Steve Shapin on how is it that in the early days of science, scientists agreed on sort of a common method in order to reach something that eventually was defined as scientific truth, because there were some grand rules that this you know, gentleman back in the day agreed on. And it seems to me that when talking about adversarialism in deliberative politics, there's an agreement that in the democratic setting assumes some consensus on the basic rules. I'm not so sure that populism is that form of adversarialism. Right? One thing is to recognize that adversarialism is intrinsic in some ways, whether to you know, discourse of phenomena, we can talk about science, or parliamentary uh, deliberations. It doesn't mean taking adversarialism to an extreme, in which the other one is not seen as an adversary, but as an enemy, which in the populist tradition, and many theories of populists have always you know, talk about um, sort of populist politics based on Carl Schmitt, distinction of friend and foe, Ernesto Laclau, of course, was the one who you know, most famously, uh, famously articulated this, this, this argument. So I think that is different how adversarialism works in democratic politics or in populism that walks on the edge of, of democracy. On the second one, um, that there are sort of positive developments in the way that in these current times, uh, citizens engage with democratic politics, absolutely right, right? Um, and I recognize and I think that there's plenty of areas showing more opportunities. And in fact, I'm not suggesting anything that, you know, praising the good old days, not at all. But actually, it is, it is a question about sort of half empty or half full. We see positive developments and then we see troubling developments. So the question is, what, what seems to weigh more, more heavily? These positive trends, or what I try to lay out, these this negative trends. And in this current moment, my sense is that probably we put it probably much hope on the political consequences of this positive, sort of more horizontal participatory phenomenon around uh, digital communication in this new public communication um, uh, era. And suddenly we are confronted with this more troubling sort of, quote unquote, the dark side of much of what we have seen. I'm currently starting a project on, on the, the cultural backlash in Latin America uh, related to many gains in human rights policies. And it's all driven by local grassroots citizens groups with a lot of help from traditional institutions in driving basically cultural reaction against this in a way that is incredibly efficient in the way to do that. Is it democratic? If by democratic we mean more horizontal forms of communication? Yes. Is it democratic in terms of the consequences or in terms of the kind of dialogue or lack of dialogue that it promotes? I have some doubts that it is. So um, that's my take on the sort of, on the good things and the not so good sort of trends of the last 10, 20 years. Uh, along the lines of what you um, discussed. Um, thank you. to start with the distinction that you made between what populists say and what they do, um, which um, I agree with. Um, but also, uh, you, you, your conclusion was, was uh, one in terms of anti-populism and using the sword and not the spoon, which in itself is quite adversarial. And I was wondering whether you find um, any um, reason to think about uh, what populists say and taking that seriously as opposed to what they do in terms of what they claim to be the truth and what 
a lot of their supporters seem to also recognise as the truth of this gap between elites and the public in terms of uh, political obs politicians' obsession with images uh, rather right. than substantive politics and so on, and whether that uh, kind of acknowledgement of, of some of what they say rather than do should form part of, of a response in terms of anti-populism. Right. Of course, populist discourse matters, but we should take it carefully, approach it carefully in terms of why it matters, whether or not it is, you know, quote unquote, symbolic politics, or is something more than that. Um, and that's why, and the reason why is at least from where I come from, intellectually, academically, much of the analysis around populism was around populism, populist discourse. And rarely matching that with what actually happened, the policies promoted, you know, who benefited from populist government, so on and so forth. And that's why I'm probably willing to exaggerate that argument a bit, just to cautious. You know, what is it, how do we go back, how do we match the analysis of populist discourse with the analysis of what actually populists do in, in government after they come to office? Um, yes, we know that right-wing populism, you know, populist discourse talk about some topics that are not present in left-wing populist discourse in spite of some similarities. That is interesting, it's relevant. It's not the full story. That's the argument I was trying to make here. Um, otherwise, we end up concluding that, I don't know, some current commentators recently saying, well, Trump betrayed populist Trump. Well, if you believe that at time one in the campaign he was a populist, then of course, you know, you will be, you know, he disappointed, or I told you so, it was just symbolic politics to get elected and then do what, you know, in some ways conservative Republicans with a strong doses of nativism and racism actually do in office. Well, I'm surprised if you believe one thing in the, in the first place. That's, that's what I'm trying to basically sort of uh, 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 contextualize when we do discourse analysis. Not because it doesn't matter, but because we might draw the wrong conclusion. Um, so, I give more examples on that. In the case of Latin America, to me, it's like exhibit A of, of that sort of divorce completely between what populist discourse is and what actually populism ends up um, doing. Um, so I've been sort of, I don't know, burned once or twice with that line of inquiry, and that's what sort of is, it's a cautionary note, basically. Thank you. Um, well, this was a really powerful uh, lament for liberalism. Uh, you have t told us about the chaos that surrounds us, and you have challenged us to think about what, what you do, what we can think, try to do in the face of chaos. Um, and I wonder whether you think these two things are things that we can do. One is to have normative confidence the other is to have policy regulation, uh, tedious and dull though policy regulation is, is something that works. And I give you a couple of examples. Trump won the election in the United States. It was a great misfortune for the American people, but he also has the lowest poll ratings of any American president. And that's because the media has continued to do their job in the United States, and they're doing it extraordinarily well mm -hmm. in many respects. I think about policy regulation. Murdoch had a project to destroy public service broadcasting in this country by introducing Sky as a better resourced competitor to the BBC. The Competition and Markets Authority have just decided to not allow him to do that, or at least to hold him back for the time being. I think there are a lot of things that you can do in these quite small policy, normatively driven ways mm -hmm. that are important. And if I had to put into three words what you can do in the face of chaos and in terms of scaling up globally, I would take the old concept of public service broadcasting, I would call it public service communication, and I would say 
that one of the most important normative projects at the moment, which certainly shouldn't be abandoned in any kind of hopelessness or helplessness, is public service communication. That is to say, the assumption that communicating truth is not simply a commercial or marketable commodity, but it is a service which should be provided without any profit attached to it right. as a public good. Absolutely right. I mean, I think the question is not giving up the principles or the convictions, right? But finding in the current conditions, political conditions, technological conditions, how those principles are still viable in a very different landscape than the one we had with all the difference that we know 20, 30 years ago. Um, so if anything, my, you know, my position is to make a call, how do we translate that into reality as opposed to how do we insist in the inherent goodness of those principles that in some ways we still can believe we can still share, even if we might be critical, try to revisit some components of it. But how do we do it that, that way? And to me, this is, um, I'm, I'm beginning to write a book about um, activist academics in communication. And, and part of the reason is, what actually are people doing? You say like, you know what? These arguments may work in theory. Let's see if they work in practice. And people working across a vast landscape of, let's say, policy with, with large, in how you translate some of these ideas into very challenging political strategic circumstances. So um, that's, that's the hope, or that's the way to find the hope in a very, and otherwise sort of very sort of challenging, sort of gloomy um, um, picture. Um, That, that will be my, my, my take on your comments. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much. It's a terrific presentation on such an important subject, uh, north, uh, east and west of the Atlantic and north and south. Um, I want to uh, mention two things. Um, the dangers of complacency and the impossibility of compromise. <laughs> so I'm being a little bit provocative. Um, on the dangers of complacency, um, I'd like to point to the new film, The Post, um, recently available in the UK, about the um, great battle fought by the Washington Post and the courage of the people involved, the editor and the owner, the owner played by a famous mm -hmm. woman actress, um, to, 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 to publish the Pentagon Papers. And um, it, that's okay, but it ends with... Um, the burglary at the, at the Democratic offices, so it ends with the Watergate burglary, which, as everybody in the audience knows, or, sorry, correction, the older people in the audience know, right. that then led to the impeachment of Nixon. Yep. So Nixon, who, if you like, is the Trump, uh, it, it's all going to be okay because he'll go. <laughs> um, well, uh, the, but the first complacency, which is about the owner, the company that owns uh, the Post, and the editor of the Post, is you look at the way how they live is represented. And I'm astonished really that a very great filmmaker can make the mistake of not seeing that those people are incredibly complacent. They are incredibly complacent and they share so much with each other, right. politicians and high up press people. Right. So I just flag up that problem of complacency and I contrast it with, um, let's say, Black Lives Matter. Now, Black Lives Matter cannot compromise. It cannot compromise just as people in the north of England who for decades have lived with the very, very bad end of deindustrialization, they cannot compromise. So I, I just want to flag up this problem around complacency and those who cannot compromise. Yeah. And solutions have to be found for that, which are not only communicative solutions. Right. Um, great point. I fully agree with you on this. And, and so the question will be understanding uh, the policy of complacency. What, what explains that, these chummy environment settings that, in some ways, the movie portrays that, and that in spite of that, something, let's say, good eventually happened. But those who know, you know, Washington politics know exactly how that works or fails to work. That is a very narrow view of the way these issues 
about accountability and transparency actually work, and the culture of complacency, of friendship, of you know, lobbying and economic and political ties actually is so powerful that in some ways the movie only touches the surface of that. Um, I live in Washington for 18 years, so I front seat to actually how that works with journalists and sources and you know, the, the entire thing. The exception is what happens. Right, so understanding in what cases someone is willing to, let me use this word carefully, break ranks with the social and political milieu, with your friends, and do something that is judged eventually as a bold move. Um, so that's what I will find, and I'm sort of always interested in, in, in finding where the break will happen that will challenge the current circumstances. It's an elite conflict. It's a pressure from below. It's organizations, and that's, that seems to me is sort of something sort of to uh, uh, investigate further, sort of when the system is complacent with anti-democratic tendencies and in what circumstances is willing to sort of challenge the status quo or go beyond um, the conventions, the boundaries, right? I enjoyed your uh, presentation, Sylvia. Thanks very much. And on the um, the topic, uh, the question of what is populism, because I know you mentioned that earlier. Um, if it's a reaction primarily to well, an anti-establishment anti uh, reaction um, against elites, one the two two people I was thinking about <coughs> was uh, Bernie Saunders and. Jeremy Corbyn. The second one, I'm sorry. The two two people I was thinking about in terms of that were were Bernie Sanders, Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn, who were possibly seen as the, one of their the, their um, reasons for success and popularity. But they were seen as outside the political elite. Although I know the right wing press would would tell you otherwise. Um, now, or. Oh, I know that Sanders did, didn't succeed and Jeremy Corbyn didn't win the general election, but he did uh, mobilise a very large proportion of the young people's vote. So I was just wondering if would you see that as the flip side of the same coin of populism, but obviously without all those negative, um, right. uh, I see what you know, the question, ne negative right. things about right. liberal and, and uh, Well, this is why this, the semantic slipperiness of populism becomes a problem when not only academics but the press and political sources in general use populism in a very sort of, you know, you can call everything in ways that it doesn't explain and further confuses what we're talking about here. Personally, I will not define them either one, and I know the Sanders case is a little bit better as, as a populist, right? Because the definition that, I mean, to me, what is the defining element, the political defining element of populism has to do with. I'm sorry. Uh, has to do with, so getting too enthusiastic about this, um, has to do with illiberalism. It doesn't have to do necessarily with the discursive critique of elites or the real socioeconomic order. That's when it gets really slippery when we talk about populism. It gets confused, you know, so then what is right wing populism and what is left wing populism? But what is unique, what is distinctive about left wing and right wing populism? at least populism cases that I have in mind, and that's sort of an, in, uh, an inductive definition of populism, is this very complicated relationship with democracy bordering on illiberalism. Um, otherwise, it gets extremely confusing to talk these two cases as, as, as populism. And again, I can talk a little bit with more knowledge about the, the Sander case, which in me, you know, will not fit that description, even though he has been called by, you know, journalists and academics, or some academics, as, you know, left-wing populist. Uh, that is, you know, we're always sort of clashing against this, you know, problem that we are bringing with us, 
which is this indefinition and ambiguity of, of populism. That's why I, I try to be much more I don't know, clear on what in my mind it means. Otherwise, it can explain everything and it doesn't explain much. So. Um. Thank you for your address. Um, I wonder if you feel there's a problem about the very special respect for freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes in <clears throat> thinking particularly of broadcasting journalism, the BBC's commitment to ideas of balance, you know, the BBC which stands for, you know, educating and informing besides uh, 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 en entertainment. Uh, I think this isn't the time of the increase in what we call vox pops. Everyone the right to, to express. And sometimes you can have a subject like uh, the moon, you know, that we, we're discussing about the moon. Someone says, well, the, the, the moon is made of green cheese. So, yeah, we've heard that now. Someone's come in. No, it, it's actually, we're bringing some more, it's actually made of blue cheese, actually. Now, we've, there might be some evidence that neither of those actually help the discussion. And then I think on probably more serious subjects like the votes to come out of the European Union, time and time again it's been expressed that uh, all the decisions are taken by this massive non-elected bureaucracy in Brussels, when the reality is that the bureaucracy right. in Brussels is actually smaller than the bureaucracy right. of the city council. And actually, the decisions are taken right. by the Council of Ministers who are, you know, originally elected politicians and the directly elected European Parliament. Now, there is some responsibility. The, NU, the, the, the journalists who are members of the NUJ have a responsibility to, you know, undermine prejudice and, and false information. I've raised this in, you know, in journalist terms and say, well, it's... That actually the journalists don't know any way about this anyway, and it's perhaps to do with their training. Right. I just wondered if you had any thoughts about this and what we can do about it. Ah, great question again. So um, the question is, to me, is whether what journalism will do about this will matter, how much will matter. Well, we can say that, yes, it matters to denounce falsehood, information that is not true, correct, fact check, the question that we have now, because we have more data and better studies, it seems to me, around this, is will it matter? Meaning, yes, what we can and should criticize journalism for false balance or you know, false equivalence, you know, giving equal time to two versions. One is, quote unquote, closer to, the, to reality, and the other one is complete lies. Should it do that? And journalism is still stuck, at least the journalism that I know better, American journalism, is still stuck in a very traditional paradigm, uh, in spite of these challenges that is undergoing right now, which is political economic challenges, is still sticking to the old notion of, let's say, quote unquote, even handedness. There are some cracks at this, an interesting cracks at this. If you look at some coverage in the New York Times, Washington Post, or even CNN, it's clearly that even handedness, objectivity, they haven't read that book in the last year or year and a half. Um, but the question is, will it matter? Will it matter if journalism denounces misinformation, information that is not, you know, doesn't match reality, whatever way you understand this, or actually denounces misinformation campaigns when you have such fracture and divided public sphere? Um, Many of us probably will hope that it, that it will make a difference. But the evidence is mixed around this, it seems to me, in terms of the how people use information to that correct or challenges sort of public officials or you know, spokespersons who straight out lie, right? Um, that is what I'm not so sure where, where the hope is. That is. And it's a question that goes beyond journalistic practice. Not because it doesn't matter, but because it's playing in a very different sort of setting, right? Um, we should not leave journalism off the hook, of course, but we should sort of rethink about what difference it makes in denouncing falsehood um, in a very different 
sort of high choice, as we like to call it, um, communication environment. Um, so uh, that's one part of it. The other part of it is that mainstream journalism, at least in the case that I know better, was complicit in the rise of populism, was not opposed to it, it was central to populism. You know, Trump is a creature in many ways of, of the media, of the commercial media, pursuing you know, profits and, and, and ratings. Um, we, I assume many of you know all this sort of data that was produced after the election, you know, how profitable uh, television networks were during the campaign largely because of Trump. The coverage that they gave him, nonstop coverage. So um, that's why populism, in my mind, at least this case that we're talking about here, has sort of a complex relationship with sort of mainstream journalism and mainstream media. Um, that's, that's what I will say. And, and you mentioned something about freedom of expression at the very beginning, which it seems to me that opens a different set of questions that probably don't have time to talk about that, uh, which is fascinating um, because of these conditions that we are discussing now. Maybe I withdraw. <laughs> no, then, then it's just a response to your your, um, your lecture, which I found very inspiring and thoughtful. And I also like particularly the last half uh, or the last part where you basically started to question how we respond to, to populism. So having suffered for two years now, <laughs> Um, I, I think I come to the conclusion that populism can actually also be welcomed as the return of the political. Um, and um, unlike what you were saying in your analysis of what democracy is like, I think this is the model or the idea, but when you look at democracy and Western democracies, say, over the last 50 years, uh, it wasn't really about um, debate because there was a kind of very strict consensus. Um, and this was mainly because the questioning of um, uh, the fundamental questioning of politics or democratic politics was externalized. We had this in the, uh, in the Eastern Bloc. Now, after the, the collapse of communism, suddenly what we see, and I think this is quite fascinating, exactly this kind of fundamental opposition emerges within democracies. And this probably is populism, but I would say more so the right wing, uh, the right wing populism. So certainly you see that d Democrats are a little bit um, running out of arguments. And I think at the moment we are trying to find arguments to respond to this fundamental questioning of how democracy works. And it takes a while to, to get your, your head into it because you can't rely on consensus and the, anymore. I feel that this is actually a great chance for the viability of democracy. Um, and so I started not really to stop suffering, <laughs> but to, to, to turn a little bit more to the chance, into the challenge, what, uh, what populism means for our understanding of, of democracy. Great point. Thank you very much. Uh, to me, it's like much of this literature that I assume many of us have produced and strongly believe in, it, it's the question of it takes a little time, right? So, any notion of recent deliberation and dialogue and this sort of affective disposition with all kind of interaction requires more than one party committed to, to that. I don't know if that's a good press charge or so good response to that, if I have to say. But the question is to think about the kinds of politics today, what is the context that I know better, is you're talking about the reality that we don't really have. Imagine what we're saying is rather a kind of post-war consensus politics in the West. At least they hope for some kind of democracy and human rights-driven politics based on some minimal consensus. 
the side of my theology and think about this. And when we talk that, at least to my students, they're like, what are you talking about? Because I've been up in a very different environment in which the way you succeed in politics and democracy is not about listening to the other. It's not about taking to the time. It's about, in some ways, interesting, ironically enough, what politics what politi says. What is the context for? It's other servants, speaking in other servants, demanding, shouting, screaming. Did you necessarily make fun? And God forbid you sarcasm. Um, rather than, let's find a common ground. Uh, the, the discourse around common ground, at least in the current context, sounds like something that people used to talk about for a while ago. Yes, not so long ago. So the question is, I'm not saying let's reject that place, not at all. But how do you think about this place if you think that that place is still necessary, viable, for the kind of democracy and fair communication that we envision? In the context of polarization, in the context in which what means in certain one quarter of my progressive politics is not really about finding the common ground, it's about trying to gain certain you know, sort of political objectives to different strategic needs, including perhaps in certain cases dialogue and deliberation. In some other cases, protest, pressure, shame. So that's what, I mean, I'm not saying anything here, but how do you, my question is, how do you reconcile the different ways of thinking, not just about different communication, but linked to different politics? Not to, because the old model is wrong, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying, how do you contextualize it in a very different situation that is not about or the one of the of course, or basic conception of the private rules of the game? Living in Washington, I'm still talking about, still talking about the, the Washington consensus. Really, this idea of elite politics today, it's no longer, I mean, what you used to feel like in the 50s and 60s, you know what you see today. Because it's that positive, but that's negative, and depending on what you think is positive. So that to me is sort of what we need to think further and actually figure out how it works in, in reality. Otherwise, I never find myself in class talking something that Getting yeah, the relationship with the is, I don't really need to get that. That's not the point that we're going to have. What, how, you make, how do you decide? How do you decide? Um. Thank you very much for having this long lecture this year. Thank you very much. Well, in recent times, I've urged various people to come to this event because I was certain it was going to be a great and worthwhile lecture. I've certainly been validated by um, how we've been treated today to um, feast of meaty, clarifying and challenging ideas. But before I move a vote of thanks to Silvio in a sort of characteristic way, um, I want to give my thanks in another direction to the late Dennis McQuail, who died last June had worked in the then called Television Research Unit in this university and was my longest standing colleague and friend and author, I think, co-author, I think, of my best book. Uh, 
Um, he was highly regarded for his um, uniquely comprehensive textbook, Mass Communication Theory, for his serious commitment to um, communication values, as in his book, Media Performance, and his immense generosity and kindliness to uh, students, budding researchers, and of course, fellow colleagues. Consequently, 21 pages of tributes to him uh, have appeared in the current issue of the European Journal of Communication. That also, I think, is something unique in our field. Well, um, um, I, I, Silvio's presence here has been particularly fitting because the School of Media and Communication is undoubtedly the most cosmopolitan department of communication, media, and journalism in this country. And Silvio is also arguably uh, at least one of the most cosmopolitan of communication scholars. It's not just that he was born in Argentina uh, did his BA in Buenos Aires, then went on for a PhD to San Diego and is now uh, based at George Washington University. I'm going to mention this for a reason. On 805 21st Street, NW, Washington, D.C., uh, many of his writings have been shaped by transnationalism. For example, articles and chapters entitled things like Journalism and News in Global Perspective, Communication Studied Without Frontiers, Cosmopolitanism Across Academic Cultures, Three Challenges for Communication and Global Social Change. And in tonight's splendid lecture, Silvio, you have drawn magnificently on the breadth and depth of your wide-ranging thought and experience. But for me, it would be best to thank you in song. <laughs> but what song? I actually thought of Worried Man Blues. But the trouble is, the last line of the first verse goes, uh, 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 I've been worried, what's it? But I won't be worried long. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that would apply. <laughs> I thought of a spiritual. I don't know if you know it. It's called, uh, There is a Bomb in Gilead. But I thought many people might mistake uh, the spelling of bomb as being B-O-M-B -B rather than B-A-L-M. So um, instead, I've um, gone to Texas, which is not your state, um, and drawn on um, uh, the streets of Laredo. Do you know it? Uh, I'll just sing the first proper verse and then convert it. <clears throat> As I went out in the streets of Laredo. <coughs> sorry. As I went out in Laredo one day, I spied a young cowboy all wrapped in white linen. Wrapped in white linen as cold as the clay. Well, its new version is Streets of Washington and Leeds. And I'm going to raise the uh, scale a bit. <laughs> as I went out in NWDC, as I went out into DC one day, I spied a professor with baggage and briefcase off to deliver a lecture next day. From a school of media and public affairs on communication challenges, he very much cares. Courageous and ruthless against all that is truthless. His message ne'er toothless about how our system fares. Oh, Sylvia Weisbord, oh gosh, What's a worm for that? Wait a minute. 
Oh, Sylvia Riceford, please street, please street a more nice chord. <laughs> Help democracy give us a much better way down with the schism of crude populism <laughs> so that tolerance and reason may once more hold sway. Thanks, Silvio. Before we leave, I just have a brief announcement to make. Tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., Silvio is also the centerpiece of a symposium that is going to take place in the Beach Grove room. Where? Where is that room? In the University House. Okay, so if you want to participate, you're all welcome. And there will be other scholars from the School of Media and Communication participating in a debate around some of the same issues that were discussed today. So now, to the drinks and buffet and...